Good morning. My name is Sebastian de Montessu, and I'm the president and CEO of Endeavor Mining. Endeavor Mining is um, today one of the top 10 uh, gold producer. And more importantly, we are probably the largest uh, West African gold producer. So we like to say that uh, we are highly focused geographically uh, in one region, West Africa, as West Africa is probably the most attractive uh, region in terms of gold discoveries for the last 10 years, and also diversified over several countries and several assets. So that's who we are, resilient business, going now for returns to shareholders. Brilliant. Lovely to meet you, Sebastian. We, we've not spoken on that before. Um, obviously, the, your reputation precedes you uh, with regards to uh, the company for sure. But hey, tell me a little bit about this. So how, how long have you been involved with the business and um, you know, you know, what were you brought on to try to do? Um, so I've been, uh, I've been on uh, Endeavor for now six years. Um, the way it worked out is um, I built up uh, La Mancha uh, with uh, an Egyptian billionaire called Naguib Sawaris. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the Sawaris family, but Naguib was highly successful in telecom. Uh, and um, based on that, back in 2012, we decided, I mean, jointly to uh, take over a small junior company in Canada called La Mancha. Uh, and from this company, we basically had uh, two sort of assets, an Australian asset uh, and African assets. And uh, what we decided taking private this, uh, this vehicle is to grow the Australian assets and then vending those assets into evolution mining. Uh, at the time, we took 30% of evolution mining and Naguib and myself joined the board of evolution to help Jay Klein, the CEO, to grow evolution, uh, who three years down the road, then became the second largest uh, gold producer in Australia after Newcrest. Um, and we progressively sold down uh, our shareholding into, uh, into Evolution. And in parallel, we had African assets, in particular in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, and decided to build a platform dedicated to, uh, to West Africa. So we vend in our, um, uh, our Côte d'Ivoire asset into Endeavour Mining. That was uh, end of 2015. In exchange, we took 30% of Endeavour Mining and uh, decided that uh, I would move on from uh, running La Mancha to turning around uh, Endeavour Mining uh, again in 2016. So since 2016, uh, I've been really the president and CEO of the company with a view to turn around and grow uh, the business. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, so that's the, that's kind of the, the the backdrop here, and you know you were you were kind of keen to point out that you've kind of got a, a resilient business, and 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 you're. Your paperwork says, you know, you took about nine consecutive years of achieving or beating guidance and so forth. And, and it kind of, get, and it kind of brings you to this point where in a meaningful way, the market expects you to deliver it now. So you don't necessarily have to talk about some of the smaller details, but now you've got a different set of problems. You, you've got to talk about the growth component, where it comes from. When you reach this level, it gets harder and harder to tell. So, you know, what is the narrative that you're feeding into the market that kind of keeps people coming back to you? Sure. Well, I think that, um, you know, the um, we basically had three steps, I mean, since 2016 in growing the business. I mean, the first step was organic growth. Uh, so during three, four years, I mean, we really spent close to a billion dollars in the business, uh, in building mines uh, and doing a lot of exploration. Uh, you know, probably important to mention that, you know, West Africa, I mean, is currently the second largest region in terms of gold production behind China and ahead of Russia and far ahead of US, Canada, or Australia. So sometimes it's not very well known, uh, you know, how big in terms of production size West Africa is. And secondly, it's been uh, for the last 10 years, uh, the most prospective uh, region for gold discoveries, uh, you know, by far. So this is an area that we've been trying to focus because of the very high prospectivity. So the first three, four years have been really in investing in the business to build mines. So we built two big mines, uh, Hyundai in Burkina Faso and uh, ET in, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, in parallel doing a lot of exploration to extend the mine lives of those mines. And then we started you know, back in 2020 uh, on the back of beginning of COVID, in fact, uh, to consolidate our position in West Africa. And we acquired in a row two companies, Semafo, uh, which had two assets in Burkina Faso, and then uh, Teranga, who had an asset in Burkina Faso and one large asset in Senegal uh, in 21. And this allowed us to basically complete the cycle of having a, a very nice shoot of you know, six assets across three different countries. So well diversified over several countries. And now we are able to you know, deleverage significantly the balance sheet simply because we have one of the lowest production costs in the sector. 
and therefore generating massive cash flow at current gold price. Uh, so we have, you know, net cash position on the balance sheet. And we're basically able to do, you know, all the things that you want a resilient business to be able to do, which is investing in your existing assets, do a lot of exploration, and be able to still generate cash flow to distribute dividends to your shareholders. Right. So if, if we look, if we look at the kind of the, the model that you're employing, which is this organic, you, you, like you spent a billion bucks on it, the organic growth um, c- component. But in the you have in the past done M and A activity. Traditionally, big companies were in the in a gold environment like this, making a lot of cash, you look to M and A activity to get noticed to kind of fill up your resource, your reserve numbers. Um, your path is what you think that you've got enough on the current portfolio to grow organically only, or would there be M and A as part of the mix? Here? Well, you know, to be to be blunt, I mean, the best way, I mean, to create you know proper value, I mean, is through organic growth uh, rather than M and A. So uh, a lot of companies are sometimes cornered and have to do M and A because they don't have an organic growth. Uh, in our case, I mean, again, because of the high prolific area of West Africa uh, from a geological standpoint. Uh, we've got an amazing portfolio of exploration, and we've been investing a lot in exploration. Uh, we're just about to complete two feasibility study for two new projects. One is the expansion uh, of our largest asset, Sabadola Masawa, to bring it to 400, 500,000 ounce annual production. And then we've got a very nice greenfield operation projects that uh, we, we aim to launch in 22, which is, you know, Fedecro in, in Côte d'Ivoire. So, you know, we're lucky enough, I mean, to have a very strong organic growth pipeline, which means that we don't have to do M&A, uh, which is also the best position you want to be if there is something, you know, attractive that comes to the market, because you're not, you don't have to pay, you know, whatever price, you know, someone is asking, because you don't need to do M&A. So either, you know, it fits your portfolio and you're prepared to pay the price you want, or you just focus on your organic growth pipeline. I mean... T- I mean that's interesting. But do you th- do you think like I think there's a sort of um, misunderstanding about uh, Africa. You, you know, you've outlined it as you know second largest gold producer after after China. Um, there's some you know, pretty big mines uh, been been uh, built there, but yeah. there's a kind of discount applied to them. So the, on the M and A front, um, I know you don't. You're saying we don't need to do it. We've, we've got to look at ret- return on capital employed, and we've got to do things efficiently, organically. Uh, it's the smartest way to do it. But are there bargains to be had? Yes, I mean, there is always, I mean, some trade-offs. I mean, as you said, you know, uh, uh, there's usually, I mean, for emerging market, you know, some sort of discounts which are applied compared to, uh, you know, North American assets or Australian assets. Uh, but in, in the case of West Africa, I think it's, you know, about risk reward. Uh, you know, if you take, let's take an example of, um, you know, the Lafigue Federico project in, uh, uh, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. We spent to date uh, about $25 million in exploration and we're going to put up a DFS showing that we have above 200,000 ounces of annual production for the next 10 years at below 900 all-in sustaining costs. So that's probably worth, you know, uh, 700 you know, million dollars, you know, for a 20, 25 million dollars initial investment. So that's the type of reward that you get into Africa is the ability, I mean, to discover, you know, significant mines and to operate them at very low cost. So why should why should people? Listen? Our audience is predominantly sort of family offices, retail. You know, there's a bit of institution in there too. But you know, they they don't have experience of of, of working in country or uh, having lived in country. But there's a perception, and I think there's some you know miss. Uh, Miscommunication, we'll call it, uh, where people are referred to Africa. Oh, it's, it's AK-47 countries. It, it's tough doing mining anywhere, but in terms of Africa and, and mining specifically in, in, in Africa, what, what are the hurdles that you, you guys have to face and, and overcome? What's the reality of doing business there versus what the, maybe some of the North American commentary might say? Sure. Well, I think, as you said, I mean, sometimes there is a bit of, uh, you know, a misperception on uh, on Africa. And, and I remember in particular when we speak, you know, in North America, uh, you know, some North American investors tends to see Africa as one single country. Uh, the reality is that it's 47, you know, or, or 48, you know, different countries. Uh, so you can't single out, you know, and say, oh, I've heard there's been a, a coup, you know, in this country. Uh, so Africa is all about, you know, uh, messing around and, you uh, Terrorism and uh, and 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 you know uh, not not being uh, secured you know when when you operate you know in those uh, in those jurisdictions. So it's not at all the case. I mean, you've got you know countries like Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, you know, if you take Cote d'Ivoire, has been for the last you know six or seven years 
one of the fastest growing country in uh, in Africa, you know, with between seven, eight percent, you know, GDP growth. Uh, it's a very mature, uh, you know, country. Uh, so operating there, I mean, is extremely, you know, safe. You know, we've got stability agreements in all the countries where we operate. But more importantly, what is interesting and sometimes uh, misunderstood is all the country where we operate are um, French francophone, you know, uh, West Africa. And all the, those countries uh, are in the same economic zone. And this has been growing fast over the last few years. Uh, it's a very strong economic zone that is somehow bringing very strong stability, I mean, to those countries. Uh, they operate with the same currency. You know, people tend to forget that, you know, all the countries we operate in are using the same currency. Uh, they tend to have the same fiscal and tax regime. So they are more and more integrated, which means that it's getting very easy as a platform and as a business to maximize the value of being, you know, in each of those countries and operate, you know, with a dedicated focus in that region. And I suppose at the end of the day, people need to look at, you know, first what I said earlier, but in, 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 in many ways, um, you get to a certain size, there's an expectation that you will deliver it because you've done it for nine years in, in, in a row. So last year, 1.5 million ounces, 1.2 uh, billion of, of operating uh, cash flow. It says you must be doing it right. Um, but there's the growth component. I come back to the growth component. So if, if I'm looking at a family office and a, and a retail guy here, I'm trying to understand what type of investment I'm making here. Because I think if if we look at uh, share buybacks, dividends, it's, it's, it's whatever that was number, so 280 million odd between those two things. Um, is this a, a, a dividend story? Is it a share growth story? Is it, I mean, what, 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 how should I perceive this company? Um, and, and I think you're completely right and touching, you know, the right, the right spot. I mean, uh, it's, uh, we're trying to be the right mix, you know, to, uh, you know, to attract shareholders, you know, over the long term. And that mix is a steady growth story uh, because of the organic growth that we have in the pipeline. So we'll be able to continue to grow uh, our portfolio uh, in terms of production. But also what is very important is maintaining a very disciplined approach, I mean, to cost. Uh, as I said, you know, we have one of the lowest production costs in the sector. Uh, and, and, and we've been completely focused on this point because what you want, you know, coming back to a resilient business is making sure that whatever the gold price environment, which we don't control, you want to make sure that you're able to continue to generate strong cash flow to allocate that to your different pillars, whether it's reinvesting in your business, doing exploration, and maintaining dividend and returns to shareholders. And the only way to do that is ensuring that you operate one of the lowest production costs uh, in the sector. So that's that's the first point. The second point beyond you know organic growth and steady growth uh, in terms of uh, uh, production uh, is having a very disciplined approach uh, towards uh, shareholder returns. So last year, as part of our uh, LEC listing, and uh, you know, very proud that uh, uh, last week, uh, you know, we, we got into the FTSE 100, uh, and this will be uh, you know, officially on next Monday. Uh, and I think it shows you know, the, the size you know, of the business that has been growing. Uh, you know, when I took up, you know, this company back six years ago, we were a $300 million market cap company uh, with about $300 million of net debt. Uh, I mean, today, uh, you know, we're about, you know, six, seven billion dollar uh, market cap company, you know, with a net cash position on the balance sheet. And last year, for the first time, you know, we were able to start, you know, paying dividends and we outlined as part of our London listing, a three year dividend policy uh, showing growth in dividend. So, you know, we're not trying to say, look, you know, we're going to put a 7% yield and this year we can pay it and next year we can't pay a dividend and so on and so on. So we said, look, you know, as long as gold price is above 1500, we will pay a minimum dividend of X, which is growing every year because we are able, I mean, to generate very strong cash flow. And if gold price is above 1500, then we have the flexibility to increase that dividend or to do in parallel some buybacks. And as you pointed out, you know, last year we probably spent close to 200 280 million dollars uh, between combination of half of dividend, half of buyback, which gives an implied uh, implied yield of probably about 4.6 percent. You know, for the company, which I think is healthy. And as I said, the objective is to continue to grow steadily. I mean, those returns to shareholders. That's interesting. And can we can we just talk about the the, the organic uh, just in terms of numbers, okay? Because um. Not only did you do the share, share buyback and, 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 the, and the dividend component of 280 million, but you, you had the impairment at uh, Bungo, um, and also you absorbed the, the, the 330 million of uh, data at Taranga, right? So the, you're throwing yeah. off a lot of cash at the moment. So 
is it can you be super aggressive with regards to the organic growth or is it a case of steady growth is in the dna it is you know the nature do you, do you need to surprise the market now no i don't think we need to surprise the market uh, you know as as i said i think we are now at a point where i think people see a resilient business uh, with nice organic growth uh, which has been delivering you know for the last 6 years on everything you know the company said they would be doing um, you know exploration has been part of our dna uh, you know some companies are just explorer others are just developer others are just operators uh, we believe that you need in this sector to be a resilient business to master the three of them uh, so exploration has always been at the heart of the company uh, you know 6 years 6 5 years ago uh, we did something that surprised the market is for the first time we came out and said we're going to invest 40 million dollars in exploration for the next 5 years you know a lot of company do that but on top of that we said and we are going to discover between 10 to 15 million ounces of indicated resources so for the first time you had a company saying i'm going to do exploration but this is what i'm going to find uh, and, you know, the five-year plan expired last year. And, you know, looking at, you know, what we've done over five years, we did 11.5 million ounces of indicated resources during that period. And most of those answers were discovered. I mean, the average price of discovery was below $20 an ounce, which is remarkable. Uh, but more importantly, the grade of those answers were higher than the average grade of the reserves of the existing assets. So it's not just adding reserves or resources just for the sake of adding them, but it's quality answers that will provide you very strong cash flow. So what's been interesting is we said what we wanted to discover and we've been able to discover it. Now that we are a bigger business, uh, we in October presented to the market our next five-year exploration strategic plan. And we said, okay, for the next five years, now we're going to invest $80 million a year in exploration because we've got that cash flow that allows us to invest in the business. But more importantly, we're going to find in the next five years between 15 to 20 million ounces of indicated resources. And if you refer to the presentation that we've made you know, on our website, you will see where we are expecting those ounces to come from. And the reason for that is, again, because of the high prospectivity of the region where we are doing this exploration. This is you know, so untouched in terms of potential for new discoveries that we are truly confident in being able to deliver those type of metrics. Okay, and if 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 I um if if I if it's so, do you mind kind of just summarizing sort of the 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 scale of that ambition again in the next five year? What's the number you're going for? I missed it. Fifteen to twenty million ounces of okay. indicated resources and investing eighty million dollars a year in exploration to okay. get that to that point. Okay, and just on, just on that, Sebastian, you said you've been announcing um, the feasibility study on the Sabadala Masawa uh, expansion. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the timing? Sure. Uh, you know, Sabadara Masawa expansion is a key project for us, I mean, going forward, because this will allow us to basically increase production there, you know, from 300, 350 to above 450,000 ounces a year uh, for the next, you know, 10 years. So it's a massive project, I mean, for us. Uh, we're just about to complete the feasibility study. And, uh, you know, I would expect this, you know, to come out in the next two to three weeks. Uh, very exciting project. So, uh, you know, watch out. I want to talk about ESG. I mean, everyone's talking about ESG at the moment. You guys have been delivering in country, in various countries in in Africa. Uh, it used, to, it used to be called CSR and social license, and now it's ESG. And uh, has anything changed for you? Do you need to change your language when talking to the, your larger institutional shareholders when you're going around doing doing the roadshows, talking to talking to the banks at, at, at conferences and and the like? Is an expectation that you need to be a different company or have you already always been doing what people are now asking? Exactly. And that's, and, and that's a completely, uh, you know, that's the right point which uh, I wanted to make is uh, it's not like we are changing what we're doing. We are changing the way we are presenting things. Uh, because, and, and that's something that I've been, you know, debating with a lot of, uh, you know, large institutions and others is ESG means, you know, impactful investment. There is probably no better impactful investment than mining in emerging countries. That's, you know, we can compare, I mean, with, I don't know, um, a producing factory yogurt, you know, in the US, what are they going to do, you know, to be impactful? Probably not much. What do we do? I mean, is just look at the impact that we have on the environment 
and the life of the people and the stakeholders, you know, where we operate is just massive. Uh, you know, when I look at, you know, government, you know, all the stakeholders, I mean, we paid probably around 280 or $300 million of taxes, you know, in country where we operate. Those are massive and they are extremely important for those countries. Uh, when you look at what we do with our communities uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of growing, you know, what we call local talents, and, and we've got a very, very strong policy around, you know, growing local talents and be able to replace progressively, uh, you know, expatriates, you know, with local talents. So we're doing a lot in terms of education. Uh, we're doing a lot in terms of uh, environment to protect, you know, the environment, because this is what we call our license to operate. I mean, it's not like, you know, suddenly we are opening our eyes and yes, we need to do that. I mean, we've been doing that, I mean, for years, because otherwise, you know, you can't operate where we operate. The only difference is now we are explaining more what we do because the investment community is interested, you know, by those things, which they were not, you know, uh, in the past. And the other thing that we are obviously doing a lot and working a lot on is uh, our CO2 emissions uh, because, and and what I like is, you know, we're not doing CO2 emissions because suddenly, you know, we're discovering we need to reduce our CO2 emissions. We're doing it because first of all, I mean, it's cheaper energy. So it makes sense for the company. So it's not just, you know, branding and marketing, we need to reduce CO2 emissions. Well, we need to reduce CO2 emission, but it has a positive impact on the company by reducing our cost. And we're doing that in sync with governments in order to help them to foster access to electricity to the local populations where we are. And this is what I like is not trying to do things which are nice from a marketing standpoint, but doing the right things. And, you know, we obviously need to market a bit more what we've been doing and what we are accelerating on. Tell me this, big companies sometimes get lazy. They get, they kind of, they forget uh, the, 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 some of the rules they set themselves earlier on. So in terms of you're, you're the guy at the top, what are the key metrics that by which you measure your team? Is it the same as how your shareholders measure you or have you got a different set of metrics to make sure that your guys are delivering? I think, and, and uh, you know, I've been in large, you know, in large groups and I walked away uh, because I basically couldn't stand anymore the frustration of things going so slowly and how many levels, you know, of authorization and, and people basically not being empowered, uh, you know, to do what they have to do and be accountable for it. Uh, so, you know, uh, we tried, I mean, to keep a very, very lean structure uh, because that's the only way, I mean, to be efficient, quick and fast. And in our industry, you need to be quick and fast. So, you know, the, the headquarters is in London. We've got probably 30 people. You know, uh, if you take, you know, equivalent size, you know, businesses that have been there around, you know, for, you know, 20 years, they probably have, you know, 300 or 400 people in the headquarter. Uh, so, you know, we've got 30 people. The rest of the team is on the ground at mine side in West Africa. And that's it. And we keep a very, very strong foot on uh, on our assets. You know, I travel uh, probably one to two weeks, you know, per month, you know, to the countries where we operate because things are happening in West Africa. They're not happening, you know, in London, in New York or elsewhere. They're happening there and you need to be able to go there, you know, very often. So it's all about speed of execution, uh, you know, small team, reactive. And then it's all about looking at the right metrics. And one of the key metrics for us is return on capital employed. You know, we're proud to say that, you know, prior to the acquisition of Taranga, we had reached this 20% return on capital employed, uh, you know, with the uh, just early acquisition of the Taranga assets, you know, we're down at the end of 21 to 18%, but we know all the work we can do to improve those assets that we acquired from Taranga. And I'm sure that very shortly, you know, we'll be back above 20% return on capital employed. So it's capital discipline and focusing on the assets in order to be reactive. Well, look, um, Sebastian, look, it's, it's, that's a nice sort of, um, overview, nice introduction to the story uh, for us. Congratulations for getting to the FTSE uh, 100. That's uh, quite an achievement um, uh, I I indeed. Um, look, stay in touch and let us know how you get on. I'm, I'm kind of in intrigued on the, the organic growth component and uh, how you guys go about uh, doing that and reporting back that to, to market. Obviously, Sabadella, uh, Masawa is uh, obviously a big, a big part of that. So um, thank you for your time today. No, thank you very much for your time. And as you said, you know, uh, I'll be more than happy to come back and give you more details on our organic growth prospects.